Thank you very much, Mr. Meister. Members of the media, good afternoon. In the weekly media briefing from Trans Tobago Police Service, this week, what we'll be putting focus on in this media briefing would be events and incidents relating to the general election. Prior to the general election, on the day of the general election, and incidents and events after the general election. I deal firstly with, obviously, prior to the general election. What you would have seen prior to the general election was no longer the norm. For decades, we saw in Trinidad and Tobago, there were certain things that would take place during a general election campaign that would cause undue frustration for many citizens of this country. Um, as, we, as it pertains to even motorcades, many, many felt that you could have motorcades without approval for however long, wherever you want to have it. And obviously, persons were affected. Many people would be inconvenienced because of massive traffic congestion, noise throughout the night, confrontation at times even between political parties because there was no actual structure or approval with, with, um, with the motorcade being held because the police would not be aware, and um, because of lack of coordination. This also was a problem throughout the country. What we did was obviously we ensured that persons adhered to the law. And that is why we enforced certain requirements for motorcades. And because of that, there was a structure. It was planned. Um, this helped the elderly, where many persons uh, um, who were of a certain age, they would, have, they would be frustrated throughout the night here in motorcades. Um, there was a virtual, it was virtually non-existent in, as it pertains to traffic congestion. Um, residential areas also were not affected. Um, we speak about nursing homes. For those who simply just did not want to be frustrated or inconvenienced due to the noise and motorcades and the traffic congestion for hours. Likewise, you will see in Trinidad and Tobago, this is probably the first general election that we have seen, that when you look, you're actually seeing the walls, the, in the private and public walls being clear and lampposts practically in comparison to before, where years after general election, you will see posters, stickers all around the country. The whole country would have been defaced. This obviously was also against the law. We advised the relevant political parties, and by and large, most of them adhered to our request. End result, prior to the general election, it was virtually crime-free, it was incident-free, it was traffic-free, hassle-free, party clash-free, noise-free, and defacing property-free. So it was something that was of value to the country in how did the Trans Tobago Police Service handled our operational plans prior to the general election. During election day, I take this opportunity yet again to commend the officers of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. There was over a 95% turnout. Um, they ensured that the general election was free from fear. Um, there was, we had immense patrols, high visibility. We provided the deterrent. We had an operational command center that was in effect from 4 a.m. throughout the night um, that, that same day. And there were, there were virtually no incidents. On the night of the general election, um, there were a few constituency offices where persons were celebrating and obviously it went over um, the requirement of um, not adhering to the COVID regulations, the Trinidad Tobago Police Service. We were forced to speak to these individuals and each and every successful candidate where there was that situation with excess persons, they adhered to our requirement and the crowd dispersed. Um, again, I wish to thank also the general public. They complied. They dispersed immediately wherever there was a situation where the crowd would have um, accumulated, especially after the general election when the results came out. We were anticipating serious concerns at the bars, the watering holes, and even political party headquarters. That did not take place. Um, there was just one incident or a, a report, and that was just a matter of concern, and I clarify that with the public, where we saw a situation where the police, we were, there was a report that came from a political party accusing the police of trying to stop people from voting by having roadblocks. I wish to clarify that there was never any roadblock. Um, and they also tried to, there was also the perception trying to allude to the fact that there was a degree of bias by the police service in trying to stop persons from getting to vote. I certainly didn't know that um, the, based on the vehicle that people have, the police officers will know who is red, yellow, green. So it was absolutely comical to try to allude that the police were involved in some type of clandestine campaign to try to prevent persons from voting or specific persons. Also, 
Um, it is, I think it is very illogical for persons who want to get in office and to govern to try to allude that the police officers must back off and allow persons to break the law. And again, social media is also that avenue where everyone feels that they are a police officer and they will know what can and cannot be done. So persons were upset that the police officers were, they were doing what was required. That place, Evan Street in Curep, every week the police were always there. Persons who felt that they were more police than police they were trying to tell us that we should not be there, persons should go up a one way, traffic lights should be broken, people should break the law, block roads, cause traffic congestion because it was general election. It does not work that way. It was still a day in this country and we had to work, we had to perform. And because of it, it was not a roadblock, but just a few vehicles were stopped because they were breaking the law. Um, the, most, the biggest concern I had is that in that letter by that political party, it directed the commissioner of police to arrest police officers. Now in my just under two years as a commissioner of police, it is the first time that I have seen politicians try to direct a commissioner of police to arrest persons because that is what the letter said, that I, must, uh, that I should arrest the police officers. I wish to guide the wannabe police officers who are politicians or, or whoever, please understand there's a procedure, there are, there are protocols, and you don't just arrest persons because they are adhering to their responsibility as police officers. As we move now, so we just spoke about prior to and during the general election, as we now move on to incidents or events after the general election, that is from Tuesday morning to this present period. There were a few matters. Um, there have been several accusations, hearsay, and reports. And I wish to take this opportunity today just to clarify some of these matters and to give a status report on some of these incidents. Um, I will now ask the DCP operations, DCP Ford, to deal with three specific matters, briefly, um, dealing with a report that um, came from in Tunapuna, I think Tunapuna in the East West Corridor, where, it was, where police officers were accused of taking boxes and police in marginal seats supporting one political party. Now, before I hand over to Mr. Ford, I just wish to clarify that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service is an independent organization. We are not here to be biased, to support, or to directly align ourselves, or to discredit, or to target any politician, any political party, or any citizen of this country. Um, so there are things that we will do that will not please individuals. There are things that may please persons, but that is not our business. We do not care. We, are, we have a job to do. Um, as it pertains to a report where police officers were being accused in marginal constituencies in the recount, what we did, obviously, we got police officers external from those marginal constituencies to provide support in that area to take away that perception and accusation, wrongfully, of course, of police officers being involved in some type of clandestine operation. So Mr. Ford will just clarify that matter of the reports and allegations of police officers removing boxes. He will also give an update pertaining to the polling cards found in Pinto Road, Arima, and also um, an update pertaining to fishermen being held for um, in being involved in illegal activities of um, assisting in bringing in persons from uh, South America. Uh, Mr. Ford. Yeah, thank you very much, Commissioner. And all, all present here this afternoon, Good afternoon to you all, good afternoon to the wider population of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, when the commissioner started, he, he was the first, he thanked the officers who performed duty prior to, during and even after our general elections 2020. Again, on behalf of the, the commissioner and the executive, I want to truly endorse that thank you. Our officers came out and they did human service to the population of Trinidad and Tobago. We actually had an unofficial contract with you all, Trinidad and Tobago, and we kept our part of it. And we want to thank you all for keeping your part of the contract. And that augured well for the success that we can say today and speak about. And as the commissioner said, by and large, we had a quiet elections, largely in part to what we as police officers did, and then the responsible behavior of the majority of the citizens. We had two main issues that got our attention, and that was what we would call post-elections. The first one was an allegation by a political party that two ballot boxes were stolen with assistance from police officers and transported to the Tunapuna police station and kept it there secretly. Now, that allegation was utter rubbish. It was the furthest thing from the truth. But then, to show the impartiality of the police service, Whenever an allegation or report is made to you, you have to take action. And we took action whereby 
under the guidance of the Assistant Commissioner of Responsibility for that area, the entire Tunapuna police station and its surroundings, the entire compound, was searched thoroughly. And guess what that search turned up? Nothing, nada, zilch. No boxes were found. But more than that, we also had a conversation with the returning officer for the returning center that the allegation was made against. And lo and behold, the returning officer said that all ballot boxes, all ballot boxes were accounted for. The second allegation, so that laid rest to that allegation. The second allegation that we had was some type of impropriety as it relates to polling cards. Now on Wednesday the 12th, just after 6 p.m., a quantity of polling cards was found at an abandoned lot at Motley Street off Pinto Road in Arima. That matter is on the investigations whereby we have appointed a team of investigators to look at that issue. We are engaging the attention of the the Action Boundaries Commission, TT Post, the person who found the ballot, the ballot cards. That person has been interviewed, a statement has been recorded, and that matter is under investigations. At this time, the investigations are still ongoing, so we have not con con conclusively closed it, so we cannot give you an outcome. But when the outcome is there, we will, we will provide it to you. The third item, that is rather worrying, and worrying, and it should be worrying for all of Trinidad and Tobago, is that citizens, notably fishermen, are taking jobs to transport illegal immigrants from Venezuela to Trinidad. We have arrested a few of those, and first I'll speak about in Western Division, on the 25th of July, a fisherman took his boat, went to Venezuela, and returned here with about 32 Venezuelan nationals. He was held by Coast Guard officers, handed over to the police, inquiries between the police service in collaboration with the immigration department were conducted. The Venezuelan nationals were eventually quarantined and they were subsequently repatriated back to Venezuela. I have to inform you here that that, Venice, that fisherman from Trinidad and Tobago from Las Cuevas was charged for 32 counts of aiding and abetting in the illegal entry of illegal immigrants into Trinidad and Tobago. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the penalty for engaging in that activity when you have been found guilty is $50,000 or three years hard labor. We want to beseech fishermen. From what we have been told, fish biting abundantly out in the Gulf. Go in the Gulf, fish, sell your fish. $50,000 today is not, an e is not an easy thing to come by, to part with. We also have some fishermen who are arrested in the southwestern peninsula. Inquiries are being conducted with those persons, and they will have their day in court. And when they are found guilty, they also will have to pay that $50,000 as a fine to the state. Okay. Sir? Thank you very much, DCP Ford. As we, as we move on, before I hand over to DCP Jacob to deal with a few three, uh, three matters, I am taking this opportunity as the Commissioner of Police and on behalf of the Trinidad Tobago Police Service to all citizens of this country, I am asking everyone, can we please tone it down? I am asking for the country, let us take a deep breath and calm down. In the last few days, it seems that there are many persons, based on emotion, based on anger, based on frustration, we have seen a high degree of hate racism, jealousy, bitterness, and so in division. 
A few months ago, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, we were the ones being targeted in a race campaign, if you recall, of Black Lives Matter. As some people, we must always try to find an invisible enemy to spit hate and just to make sometimes make yourself relevant. There was even a political party that used their whole campaign to attack the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. Well, he gathered less than 300 votes out of 1.4 million people. And just two days after getting the cutel of your life, you go back again and start to attack the police service. I ask the public to please understand who, who these individuals are. Their job is to try to make themselves relevant. I ask we, we ignore such irrelevant persons and also non-productive individuals. Now, before I hand over back to Mr. Ford on, on this matter pertaining to social media, we've seen a lot of this hate campaign division in this country based on what we've seen recently on social media. Now that the police is not the enemy, now the enemy is based on who is red or who is yellow or who is afro trini or who is indo trini I ask the nation again to please take a deep breath and stop. And persons will ask, well, what is the police involvement in trying to get involved in situations pertaining to racial confrontation, um, political bickering, and it is straightforward. Many of these accusations and statements being made, persons are actually breaking the law. And more so, this division, hatred, bitterness, it is going to cause confrontation and it can cause violence. So in that regard, this is why the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, we have now seen it fit to get involved, to ask the country yet again, calm down, take a deep breath. If the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service can be used as a catalyst towards uniting the country as being the prime independent institution of the state, we would do so. And I will now ask DCP4 just to briefly state the situation pertaining to the number of reports that we have seen on social media of persons threatening the lives of individuals and committing other acts of crime. Mr. Ford. Yeah, th thank you again, sir. Trinidad and Tobago, we have been known internationally as a rainbow country. It means that every creed and race, every religious sector has an equal place in this country. And as the commissioner has just said, we have seen something that is rearing its head, that is unpleasant and unpalatable, and certainly unacceptable on our beautiful Twin Island Republic. People have a way that they say, uh, in local parlance, are talking my mind. And whilst freedom of speech is enshrined in the Constitution, that freedom is not absolute, and you have to moderate responsible behavior. And because of the amount of hatred posts that have been bombarding the airwaves, we have actually started our investigative procedures to find those. And if found wanting, they will be prosecuted. We have three areas that we are looking at generally as it relates to these offenses. We have from the most serious sedition, under the Sedition Act. We have under the Offenses of the Persons Act harassment. And we also have threats that can lead to assault under the Summary Offenses Act. And if I may briefly, I just want to read something to you to show you that that responsible behavior is incumbent upon all of us. From the Sedition Act, it says briefly, a seditious intention is an intention to raise discontent or dissatisfaction amongst inhabitants of Trinidad and Tobago, to engender or promote feelings of ill will or hostility between one or more sector, sections of the community on the one hand and any other section or sections of the community on the other hand, or feelings of ill will towards hostility to or contempt for any class of inhabitants of Trinidad and Tobago distinguished by race, color, religion, profession, calling, or employment. Many of these posts more than qualify for what I've just read here. And once we find you and we have the evidence to support it, you can be charged for either sedition, you can be charged for harassment, and just briefly harassment of a person under the Offenses Against the Persons Act 
includes alarming the person or causing the person distress by engaging a course of action or conduct such as making contact with the person whether by gesture, directly, verbally, by telephone, computer, post, or any other way, giving offensive material to the person or leaving it where it will be found by, given to, or brought to the attention of the person, acting in any manner described in subparagraph one to five towards someone with familial or close personal relationship to that person or acting in any other way that could reasonably be expected to alarm or cause that person distress. This is the law, ladies and gentlemen. And as the Trent Tobago Police Service, you have a responsibility to educate you so that you will desist from that type of irresponsible and criminal behavior. Because if you continue, we will prosecute you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, DCP Ford. Before I hand over to DCP Jacob, again, just to clarify this matter, persons will state that based on social media, it is my constitutional right. It is my democratic right to say and do what I want. That is inaccurate. I actually saw, even though there was an advertisement in a political, a political advertisement where someone, a politician was stating that you do not have absolute right. And he was correct. And that was seen as something negative. If you have absolute right to do and say as you want, it means that you will now infringe on the rights of other persons. And that is what is happening right now on social media. Persons feel that it is my right to say what I want about anyone because it is my right to do so. As soon as you interfere with the rights of others and you, there may be a law being broken, that is where the Trinity Tobago Police Service would get involved. I understand that persons are very emotional, persons may be hurting, persons may be very happy, but you cannot use emotion as an excuse to attack and infringe on the rights of others. As, before I hand over to DCP Jacob, um, the, three, the three matters that he will um, put it into the $94 million drug bust seizure, seizure, weapons being seized, and matter pertaining to uh, the very unfortunate incident where a Venezuelan national, a young lady, was raped, abducted, and almost left for, and left for dead. I met today with the TTV, the Trinidad Tobago Venezuela, which is a non, an NGO group that deals with the concerns of Venezuelans in Trinidad Tobago, especially as it pertains to abuse and crime. Um, some persons, again, on social media, so it fit that because it is perceived as who may be the individuals involved in this crime, why have the police, why have not, we, we have not said anything. Again, many people want to be police officers. It seemed that when they were small, they wanted to be police officers when they were young. Please, if you do not understand the role and function of the police service, how we operate, it is a professional organization and we cannot make knee-jerk decisions or comments that can affect an investigation. There is a difference between an arrest and a charge. If someone is arrested, we cannot go forward and make comments to the public that can affect the charge being laid because it can then mean that it can affect the investigation, it can compromise it, we can, the, the defense attorneys can speak about media sensationalism, so there's a reason for it. It does not mean that we are covering it. In fact, if it is that people, as it pertains to Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, I have said all on all occasions, the same way it is that I will defend my officers if unjustly targeted, I will be the first to deal with police officers. In the last 18 months, 48 police officers have been charged for various offenses from rape, kidnapping, murder, grievous bodily harm, money laundering, drugs, and so forth. 78 cases have been made, and 77 officers have been suspended. So it shows that we are not covering it up. And I would ask the public, do not look at these, these numbers to state, well, it means that we cannot trust the police. Just the opposite. There's a reason why there's been an increase in public confidence and trust in the police service from 14 to 30% over the last 18 months because it shows that we are not covering it up. We are not going to turn a blind eye to rogue elements. I intend to clean up the police service. But the best way to do this, it must be done in a transparent manner. It cannot be knee-jerk, and we cannot rush now to boast about persons being arrested that can affect an investigation. So just to clarify, some people, because of the emotion of what took place with this young lady, they wanted to see um, results. They wanted to get comments. We cannot make comments until we complete the investigation. I give you the assurance, we, yes, persons have been held, but we must make sure we go through the process, and only if and when charges are laid would we make statements. And again, as it pertains to this, 
we, we look at the number of situations we've seen recently in this country pertaining to persons being abused, especially um, as it pertains to Venezuelan nationals, um, some of them virtual slavery, ch uh, child, we have child prostitution, we have seen a situation that I'm now dealing with as it pertains to child pornography in this country. And again, persons taking advantage of individuals, both citizens of this country and also uh, nationals from South America. I wish to give the assurance to this country that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, we are in the corner of the victims. We are here for you. We are here in the corner for law-abiding citizens. You would have seen in the last few months, we have established the police app, the online reporting for persons to give information for us to, to ensure your safety and to target the perpetrators to bring them to justice. The establishment of the gender-based violence unit, the establishment of the emergency response patrol, the soon-to-be um, the establishment of the sexual offenses unit, the revamping of the child protection unit, and the cyber crime unit. All of these things is to actually help persons who are taken advantage of by criminal elements. And if police officers are involved, we would arrest them, and they would be charged if we have enough evidence. I give you that assurance. We have a problem in this country with bullies. We have a problem with abusers. And that is what we are here for. I joined the army a, a, years ago because I, I, was here, I decided that I was here to help persons who need to be defended. I became a minister of national security in the same, in the same manner. I'm here as commissioner of police to do the same thing, to help those who need to, that, to be defended. And we have seen it from women, children, elderly, um, the LGBTQ community, young men being lured into gangs by criminal elements, and even animals. They have rights, and these rights have been infringed by criminal elements in this country. We are doing all that is required to protect you, to defend you, and I give you the assurance that no one, there's no one in this country, regardless of who it is, that we will turn a blind eye because that person may be in uniform or even in a suit, regardless of who that individual is. But please understand that by bashing the police service, because you do not understand the difference between arrest and charge, you should actually do some research to understand why we cannot make a comment. The fact of the matter is that we have, and I will now hand over to DCP Jacob for further update on this matter, but please understand we cannot say much until we complete this investigation, as well as the drug seizure and um, weapons being seized recently. DCP Jacob. Thank you very much. was done over three weeks period, which led to the seizure and a major disruption in a transnational drug syndicate with international connections. The interdiction involved teamwork and coordination between the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service including with units, including the Central Intelligence Bureau, the Northern Division, the Inter, the Inter Agency Task Force, and additionally, with support from officers from the Customs and Excise Department, Port Authority, and external agencies. The eight persons have not yet been officially charged because the investigation is still ongoing. The investigators, may be required to look at additional arrests to be made. We are looking at offenses under the anti-young legislation and also the customs and excise are looking at violations under the customs and excise law. In addition, there is also interaction with other countries, including Jamaica, in an effort to identify offenses that may have occurred in that country and in other countries. I really wish to thank the officers 
from the various departments within the Trinidad Tobago Police Service, the Customs and Exile, the Port Authority, right? We are the executive of the police service. We are aware of the efforts that they are making as they continue with this investigation, and we are thankful for the commitment to duty. As it relates to the unfortunate incident that occurred in the Southwestern Police District on Tuesday the 11th of August, I wish to inform you that the young Venezuelan national young lady who was brutally attacked is presently in a stable condition at the San Fernando General Hospital. There are currently two suspects in the custody of the Trinidad Tobago Police Service. The investigation is continuing with the intent to charge the alleged offenders within the next 48 hours. It is in fact, it is in fact so that one of the suspect is a special reserve officer who is presently on sick leave. It must also be understood that when persons are arrested, as the commissioner mentioned earlier, that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service need to carry the evidence up to a certain threshold that is required by the court. Therefore, even though we may arrest persons on reasonable suspicion as is permitted by the law, we must prove our case in the court beyond a reasonable doubt. Therefore, when the arrest is made, we need to continue with our investigation. So the question of staying a while before we act actually institute the charges does not mean at all that the police intent is to cover up anything concerning the investigation. So I just want to reinforce that point, that in both instances that I refer to, the investigations are ongoing, and within the next few days, you all will get the results of those investigations and what charges are laid against the individuals in both circumstances. As it relates to our recovery in fire firearms, within recent times, we are recovering firearms in the various divisions, especially in the central, southern, northern division. And before, we were actually recovering firearms, one or two firearms. Now we are getting firearms in four and fives. Right? Um, this tells us the situation as it relates to firearms getting into our country. Yes, we are working on it. For the year so far, we have recovered 511 firearms, and a lot of persons were charged. But what is significant, that last year, around this time, as it relates to rifles, what we refer to like AK-47 and AR-15, we had recovered 21. But so far this year, we have recovered 42 of those such firearms. So this is to tell you what we are faced with and what is happening in relation to the illegal importation of firearms and ammunition within Trinidad and Tobago. Right? We have plans. The plans will materialize so that we can reduce this continuous occurrence as it relates to illegal firearms. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, DCP Ford. Before I open questions, oh, Jacob, sorry. <laughs> I was just testing you. Yes. <laughs> um, before I open questions to the media, I just want to close on, on a matter of a personal note. Again, when I ask the country to let's take a deep breath, let's stay calm, and let us stop trying to be the enemy of each other based on race, race on politics. If it is that we want to have bitterness, if we want to have an enemy, I ask the vast majority of this country who would comprise the law-abiding citizens of this great country, the bitterness and the anger should be turned to the criminal elements. I have operated in that manner several years, and I have not changed. And it goes with this comment, and I've been reading and hearing about it, about this cockroach word. And I want to use this now to open the Pandora's box. The two individuals alleged to have abducted, beaten, abused, assaulted, raped, and, which, and tried to kill that Venezuelan lady. If anybody does not want to, will not want to refer to these two individuals as cockroaches, 
well, then your principles differ to mine. The fact of the matter is, if you have a daughter and your daughter is raped, would you not refer to that person as a cockroach? If it is that your wife is killed by a cold-blooded murder, what would you refer to that person as? If your son is kidnapped and tortured, if you have a son or a young person who has been now lured to be to being influenced in drugs or joining gangs for him to be killed, what do you refer to these persons as? If it is that, again, there would be persons who may be involved in criminal activity or they may have family members, and how dare Gary Griffith refer to my family member as such? And I want to clarify to the deceitful persons who decide to lie to state that this means that I am referring to afro trinis as cockroaches. You are a liar. At no time have I ever used race. The fact of the matter is I do not care whether you're green or blue. If you're a cold-blooded killer, a rapist, a child molester, a kidnapper, if you wear the best Hugo Boss suit as a businessman or even a politician, and you say you're involved in hundreds of millions of dollars being siphoned from the taxpayers, I see you as a cockroach. And again, if persons, they want to be sympathetic, protect and defend these criminal elements, well then their principles and character traits will be different, different to mine. So yes, I do have a degree of bitterness. I do have a degree of anger because I see on a daily basis when persons, they're screaming because they've lost their loved ones. Their wife has been raped. Their loved one has been killed, kidnapped. They've lost all their possessions. And then the main focus is what Gary Griffith refers to these individuals as. So let me clarify something. As it pertains to me mentioning and referring to cold-blooded killers, rapists, kidnappers as a cockroach, and persons are offended by this, I am taking this opportunity now to apologize. The fact of the matter is that a cockroach does not deliberately try to harm anyone. These individuals do. So I apologize to the cockroaches. I am here to defend law-abiding citizens and victims of crime. Others, they are here to defend them and not have them called harsh names. If anyone sees this as alluding to the fact that this is what you call Afro-Trinidadians committing such acts, it shows your ignorance because the Afro-Trinidadian community has proven to be a very powerful force in this country to make us the great country that we are. I refer to criminal elements as what they are. And I ask the country, let us take away the hate and the bitterness based on your political party card in your back pocket, based on your race, your religion. And if you want to have an enemy, let the enemy of the state be the enemy, and that be the criminal elements. Now open questions to the media. From the media. Good afternoon, Commissioner, and to the panel, Ryan Hamilton Davis, here from Trinidad Newsday. I'm really glad that you closed off with the, with the, uh, with the comments towards the cockroach um, statement. Um, earlier this week, there, there were a few individuals connected to a, a, a major co company or a popular company in Trinidad and Tobago. They might have used the same language, um, but obviously by your definition, there was a different intent behind that language. Could you speak towards the misinterpretation of what you uh, would refer to as cockroach and possibly if um, you could once again clarify who is cockroach and who is not cockroach and who, who is done cockroach? Well I, well, I just said it. Yeah, so. Whether you want to refer to cold-blooded killers, murderers, rapists, kidnappers, persons who try to harm law-abiding citizens, that is what you will deem, whether you want to call them leeches, thieves, plunderers, parasites, insects, vermin, whatever. That is what they are. I have no intention or care or concern about where, about your political affiliation, your ethnic composition, where, you're, where you live, your financial status, whether it is that you wear three-quarter pants with it hanging down, or whether you wear, again, a Hugo Boss uniform, your suit. That is irrelevant to me. If another individual will use the name cockroach, I do not have copyright on, on, on the word cockroach, so I can't control what other people will refer to it as. My point is I am trying to get the country to understand if you have a bitterness campaign, animosity of anyone, any organization, let it be the criminal elements. And do not be fooled by, by these persons who want to be pretenders of, of all that is good when they are hypocrites just trying to build and make themselves relevant. The fact of the matter is this has nothing to do with race. We have one enemy in this country, and that is a, that is a criminal element, regardless of who they are or where they are from. 
Good afternoon, Urvashi from TV6. Commissioner, um, so you all would have talked about three things that you'd be looking for in terms of maybe the online threats, sedition, harassment, uh, threats which would lead to assault. Does that mean that the police service must now police social media? How are you going to rely um, on getting these reports? Sure. Yeah. And, and yes, we, I, I have also established a social media unit. It is not to mark and spy on persons. It is your right to make any comment on social media. However, I actually got this from NYPD. We, you know, we, uh, we actually twin with the NYPD, so there's a um, a relationship between us and NYPD. And what they understood is that through social media, they were able to extract immense intelligence as it pertains to solving a crime, stopping a crime from taking place, understanding how persons recruit criminals, dealing with terrorism. And that is where it is that we are at. Um, obviously, by, by that social, me social media, we, it will also, we will be able to pinpoint certain avenues. And that's why I've also um, reignited the cyber crime unit. We, looking at these at these matters, so it is not that we are on a witch hunt, but they are specific. As, as um, DCP Ford mentioned, persons believe that you can say and do and write what you want on social media. That is incorrect. There are certain laws that can, that are brain broken, and it can vary from terrorism, sedition, <clears throat> um, and and other acts. So obviously, so with our social media unit, it is being monitored. <clears throat> it also helps by persons submitting information to us via the app or online reporting that will target us to. Sorry, direct us to certain places for us to monitor individuals to see if a crime actually took place or if there's a plan for a crime to take place. Because we have seen over the last few days, persons are basically making accusations to kill persons. Persons are actually boasting and telling the individual <clears throat> that um, he wished that he could rape that, uh, the, the young lady. You are seeing some, there's some sick human beings out there. And we are databasing all of these individuals. And if it is that even though they may not be committing a crime, it is being logged and they are being monitored. They are going to be weighed and measured. <clears throat> okay, so with respect to the fight against COVID-19, we're seeing a lot of police stations being closed for sanitization. Could you tell us how that has been affecting manpower, one, and two, um, are police officers adequately, or maybe I should say safely, equipped to interact with the public? Is that how they're getting covid yeah, um, definitely. I'll hand over to DCP forward. But again, this is where it is I made the recommendation that the police service, I strongly recommend that each and every police officer be given a medal for their performance. Um, yes, there are many institutions that played a very big part to ensure that we can clamp down on the COVID pandemic spreading, to prevent it from spreading. But the Trans Tobago Police Service, we were the main institution where almost each and every police officer, they, we, they became in the front line. And obviously, it exposed the police officers, it exposed their family members which meant that they went above and beyond the call of duty. Other police services around the world, they were involved in violent confrontation with citizens. Some of, many of them <clears throat> abandoned their posts. Not one police officer did that. They, they came out in their numbers, they continued to perform, but because they're in the front line, it makes them the highest risk. And because of that, we have seen the situation. However, there have been many things that we've been doing. We have been adhered to the, P, to the PPE and making sure that we have all of the different things that are required to minimize the possibility of police officers being affected. And uh, DCP Ford, if you'd like to... Yeah, thank, you, thank you very much, sir. If you visit randomly any police station within Trinidad and Tobago, you will first be greeted by a sink with running water and with soap. It means that every police officer and every person coming to make a report has to comply and, and, and sanitize himself or herself. For the general elections, every single police officer was given a care bag. And in that bag, amongst other things, had wipes, sanitizing material, face masks, and gloves. But the thing is that police officers are one of the primary persons to interact with the public. Remember, we are charged with providing safety and protection to you all. So it stands to reason that we may be one of the first persons that can be contaminated. And that is what is happening. So that persons are contaminated, of course it will affect us because we want our workforce outside there 100%. But there's care being taken of those, those individuals. We are interacting with them. We're making sure that socially they are taken care of. But it, despite all of that, we can expect that once we are the primary responders, the crimes and other infractions, we will be exposed. In terms of the percentage manpower, you could just address that. 
percentage of manpower that has been affected by the closure, quarantine of officers, etc. And so I have one question after that. It is, it is minuscule. We, out of a workforce of nearly 10,000 officers, we have about 100 and just about over 150 officers who have been affected. So it is minuscule, but you would appreciate that every single officer is needed outside there, but that is how it is at present. Commissioner, you know, you spoke about election day and that certain regulations appeared to have been breached. We even heard the CMO say the same thing, um, relying on footage that we saw of the two main political parties at several areas. So people would be asking, why didn't the police close that down? Yeah, but we did. Um, there were several constituency offices after the general election and the results came out and persons just started um, assembling a mass. And immediately it happened in Samoa Barataria that there were about three or four on either side where as soon as persons got carried away, we immediately, because through the operational command center, I actually, I led the operation here along with my two DCPs on either side. And as soon as we pinpointed that there was, an, uh, you, you saw a mass assembly, immediately, just as what we did when it is that there was a plan for riots and looting and to shut down the country, we were immediately able to monitor the situation, pin, target, target the situation and see exactly what was required. It, within minutes, as soon as the person started assembling, the, our emergency response patrols, they, they went to the locations and at no time was there any confrontation or protest by the candidates and the supporters. They, they knew what they were doing. So um, it is you know, sometimes typical training. They, they push the envelope to the point and wait until the police will chase them and, and they, they did that. The police headquarters, uh, sorry, the um, political headquarters, we did not see that type of assembly we were prepared for. Likewise, the bars and all the watering holes, we expected that there would be a mass assembly of persons going to celebrate or to drown their sorrows. We did not see that. So it showed the maturity and the responsibility by the vast majority of the citizens on election night. Oh, sorry. Friday night? I know sat Saturday there was a Saturday they were, we had motorcades. Now the motorcades again, thankfully we met with the organizers of the two major political parties to understand exactly where they were going to make sure that there was no clash and it ran smoothly. The concern that we had is many of some uh, one of one of the parties they were having they were having motorcades and you'll have five persons in the car. But then as soon as the motorcade starts, four persons jump out and only the driver remains. It no longer became a motorcade, a walkercade, if that's a want of a better word. And it became, a, it became like a, a ban, a carnival ban on the street. And that was a problem. We dealt with it, we spoke to the individuals and they adhered to the requirement. Um, likewise, there was a, um, a situation where they continued to converge in having these satellite meetings, specific areas. And there was one where there were over 700. We immediately spoke to them and the crowd dispersed. So it meant that the, the, thankfully the politicians, they agreed and they understood what was required. Sometimes they had to be advised accordingly, but as soon as they got the advice, they adhered to their responsibility. All right, good afternoon, Commissioner. Peter Christopher from Guardian Media. Um, you made reference to a meeting with the um, Venezuelan group earlier. Um, one of the concerns that they raised with our newsroom was that there was a lack of trust with regard to going to figures of authority within their community. Um, was that matter addressed in the meeting and how, how, how would the police go forward in you know, building that trust with the Venezuelan community given that, again, this, this case has a, a figure of authority involved in it? Yeah, um, definitely. There was, the individuals I met, they actually broke down in tears. Um, they, they have, they have, there's a great degree of concern as what is happening. As it pertains to the abuse, especially of females um, coming from South America. We have these, the concerns as it pertains to child prostitution, abuse, virtual slavery, um, and obviously sexual offenses that will take place on some of these women, uh, which is why it is that the gender-based violence unit, it was not a knee-jerk reaction. I analyzed the situation, I saw the importance for us to have a specific unit such as the gender-based violence unit to deal with such situations. I spoke to, we spoke to them, the head of the gender-based violence unit was at that meeting. Um, with DCP Ford, we explain to them what is required, how it is they can um, adhere to it, and I will work with the gender-based violence unit through the app, through the online reporting, we will come to you. These persons are specific, they're specially trained, again, similar with NYPD, they give us the specific training to understand 
the sensitivity, the confidentiality, how to speak to these individuals, and they will be able to get information. That is what probably was missing for years in the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. There was that, and not just um, as it pertains to foreign to foreigners, but also even citizens here, where they believe that there's there's not a, there's a a very low degree of confidentiality, sensitivity, how it is that you speak to the victims. Sometimes the victims claim that they were, they were dealt as, they felt that they were the perpetrators of the crime. So the gender-based violence unit would do this. And we have given them that assurance. They, were, they left very, they left um, assured that, they, that, that we were going in the right direction. But there's another matter as well that was brought to our attention where, you know, there's this concern as it pertains to who's a refugee and who's an illegal immigrant. The fact of the matter is that these are human beings and they are being affected. As if some, them, some of them may be affected with the, with the COVID virus and they don't know if to come forward. And, and obviously we need this to happen. We need to have a degree of confidence and trust between both parties. The police service, we are not here to go hunting down, breaking down doors to find illegal immigrants and to, and to send them to the IDC. But there is a situation here where these individuals, sometimes they are being held against their will. Sometimes they are being held as virtual slaves because individuals have their passport. They are threatening them to send them back home. This is a very serious matter. Uh, we are dealing with it. Um, this is not just about gender-based violence unit, but this has to do with the intelligence units of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and Ministry of National Security. Uh, obviously, we cannot have a situation in this country where persons can treat individuals, and even minors, we are seeing 14, 15-year-old Venezuelan girls being used as prostitutes. We have reports now of, of child pornography. So there's a lot that we are doing trying to deal and try to defend persons who need to be defended. Um, so I've, I've met with the TTV. Um, we are looking at all of their concerns and try as best as possible to work with them to try to minimize these problems. And, and pardon me. Um if I missed it, I know you made reference to the, the investigation with the ballot boxes, but I also wanted to know if there's been any update with regard to the cache of um, poll cards that was found in Arima. Yeah, as, as, I, as I indicated earlier, we have assembled a team of investigators along with CSI officers to prove that find. That matter is being act engaging the attention of the police service, but the investigation is still at its infancy state. We are collaborating with the Election Boundaries Commission, with TT Post, and other stakeholders at this time. Uh, hello again, Commissioner and panel. Um, I want to go back to the police services handling of COVID-19. Um, our office received some uh, complaints from certain officers saying that you know, they, they indicated to their superiors that they may have some form of flu-like symptoms and they weren't given advice. Um, and some might even been asked, you know, may have been accused of probably just, you know, playing sick. I mean, I mean, obviously in Trinidad, there's some, there's some factor of that, you know, and, and so on. But have you been made abreast of anything like this? And how mm -hmm. does the police service itself handle complaints? You know, I have a fever, I've been sneezing and, and so on. And what is the advice you would give to police officers on, on so? No, there's a specific protocol. At no time has, has there been any such uh, complaint accusation that we, did, we, we totally ignored. Obviously, if there's one police officer who may be believe the slightest chance that, that he may be affected, obviously we have to take immediate action because there's going to be a domino effect in that station and we have to get it cleared as, and sanitized as quickly as possible because when you shut down one police station, obviously, you now affect national security. So we have to deal with this immediately. We cannot just cover it up, have window dressing, and, be, and hope that the problem goes away. The COVID pandemic does not go away when it is that you try to ignore it. So as soon as there's anything even remotely close to a police officer perceived as being affected, um, infected, we immediately to do, um, conduct the relevant protocol. I mean, in fact, it happened with DCP Ford and myself. We were, what, two, three carriers? Yeah. And, and we, had, we had to be tested because, um, um, just to make sure. So we, this is done constantly, especially with police officers, because as I said, they're in the front line, and obviously it means that they will be the highest risk. But every time that there's a situation, we immediately take all of the protocols from sanitizing the, the buildings, looking at all the individuals, look at who he or she may have interacted with, and provide them with all of the necessary equipment prior to them actually going out on duty. Okay, um, now, considering, now, considering the, the uh, minister's advice, basic, basically, if you're feeling sick, stay home. I mean, I know that might not be able to, well, police officers may not be able to do that on the outset, but uh, is there a protocol in that in particular? You know, do they, do they stay home? 
do they call in or do they come to, to a place where they can be tested? Um, since uh, in March, we have designed the protocols that were sent out to the police officers that guide them. Once the police officers are showing any flu-like symptoms, they are advised to go home. The supervisors are so guided to send the persons home. We don't, because we know the kind of effect it will have if that person, in fact, is infected and stay within the station area. So that we have organized our system in such a way that if that happens, we can respond and have officers still fill the gap. So the protocols are clear in relation to that aspect, and there is no supervisor who is guided to make efforts to keep the officers on the job once they are showing flu-like symptoms. Even though, if you have the opinion that the officer is in fact faking, we have no alternative but to send the officers home and then to follow okay. from there, we follow the protocols of the Ministry of Health. All right, uh, two quick ones. I want to get some updates on uh, some investigations and updates on the investigation into the, the uh, group of soldiers and police officers that may have allegedly abused a, a, a civilian, forcing them to do push-ups, um, drinking punch, and that, that, um, that one. Um, the, uh, update on the investigation into the mover killing. Sorry, the mover? The mover, mover killing yeah. and uh, the shooting of a beaten woman during the riots and so on. What are the investigations into that? And if I could go back to Mr. Jacobs' uh, contribution with the uh, rising fire and um, high-powered weapons and AR, the AR-15s, these rifles and so on. Now, we know the caliber of um, ammunition that's being used, that could be used as 5.5, 5.7, right? Um, yeah. Um, has there been a rising collection of these shells on crime scenes, you know, and, and what does that indicate as well? Okay. Um, as it pertains to the three, the, the three matters, they're they are still being thoroughly investigated. Um, I don't know if Mr. Cody have any update that you can bring. Not at this time, sir. Um, the, we, we, remember, we already, we already charged yes, the, the, the persons. Yes, the, the first one pertains yeah. to the two soldiers and the yeah. two police officers, yes. Mr. Yeah, yeah. Oh, were the soldiers charged in that? Was yes, the last for... time we were here, we talked about the disciplinary action that was taken, and the persons were in fact charged. All right. Yeah. Okay. So it's and just the two others that is outstanding that you refer. And as far as the AR-15s, I'm sorry. Okay, I will respond to that. Um, in some in some instances, in um, when we have the drive-by shootings, and we are in fact getting the, the the shells, right? It is very valuable to us because we are doing work on the other side in relation to ballistics. Right, that will be, uh, help us significantly in our investigations. And as we go along very soon, you'll be, you know, we'll be getting some more positive outcomes. And we are also working on that aspect in relation to the firearms coming, within, coming in the country. I believe within a short space of time, the commissioner will be able to speak on that as we continue our investigation in that area with our international partners. And, and just, just a note on, in Tobago recently, based on intelligence, the first five months in Tobago, there was not one murder. Then it moved to eight. We realized that there became um, certain criminal elements in Trinidad and Tobago. They started to migrate to Tobago. I sent a team from the Special Operation Response Team, in sort, with about 30 officers. We flooded Tobago, and right now Tobago is a hotbed. Um, they, are, they are trying to clean up Tobago as quickly as possible. I, I think certain persons have been charged, weapons seized, and we're doing as much as possible to, to ensure that Tobago can go back to how Tobago was earlier in the year. Commissioner, um, you spoke, you gave some statistics earlier about 48 police officers being charged, 78 cases, 77 officers suspended. I can't remember the time frame That's exactly. It, last 18 months. 18 months. Last 18 months. Is there any concern about um, the rigidity of the recruitment process? The, the recruitment process is second to none. We have actually established it in line with what, what is best practice in many other police departments or services in North America and Europe. The recruitment is not an issue. The issue lies with the authority that the commissioner of police would have. And again, we go right back to the situation. I'll give you a perfect example. Obviously. When we look at the situation with um, the individuals who are presently being held on and if these individuals are charged, just say one of these individuals is a police officer, and he is charged 
for rape, kidnapping, abduction, attempted murder. I, as the commissioner of police, will want to immediately fire this, this individual. I do not want individuals like this in the police service. But we have persons in this country that will tell me, innocent until proven guilty, he must have his day in court. Very few police services in the world operate by waiting on the court. I need to clean up the police service as quickly as possible, and I cannot have my hands tied when police officers who are involved in criminal activity, rape, kidnapping, grievous bodily harm, murder, and you're telling me that I must wait until this individual is found guilty in court. The Trent Tobago Police Service, we come from society. Society is not perfect, neither are we, but we are expected to be at a higher standard. So one of the issues to try to clean up the police service is the problem with many of these who are suspended should be fired. Because they, they, if it is that these individuals, probably even in your media house, and they committed an act like this, they would be fired. So why is it that it's good for a media house that an individual could be fired, but in the police service, you're trying to state that he must remain? One of the issues is that every police officer is trained in law, so everybody is a lawyer. So I get bombarded with letters as to why it is I lost one point, why it is that I was transferred here, why I'm not getting my overtime allowance, because everybody is, a, is a, a legal expert in the police service. And they fight and they complain. We have reached a point where an individual actually went public, went and boasted, uh, he, made, he boasted about, he stands on the principles of a political party, which is in breach of the police regulations. He was immediately suspended. He can make a song about it all he wants. But, th but that is where we've reached now, where police officers feel they can do what they want, when they want. And I'm speaking about the three, it's just about two to three percent. Of the, of the police service. The vast majority, they have stuck with the principles, the character of what was uh, on the foundation that built them as a police officer in that same recruit training. So that is not the issue. The issue is when some of them shift in the wrong manner, I am left with my hands tied when I want to fire them immediately and I'm told that we must wait until they're, they're day in court. I'm gonna fight this and I'm, I will go to court on this if I have to. Police officers who are rogue elements who have committed acts of grievous bodily harm, rape, kidnapping, murder, any serious crime, and they are charged, they should immediately be fired. Uh, my final question, a new government is to be sworn in. Now, the TTPS falls under the Ministry of National Security. We may or may not have a new Minister of National Security. Um, I don't know if you'll be willing to say your preference, one, but, but more importantly, is there anything that you would like to see improved? Or do you have a wish list for this new minister? Not at all, it'll be totally inappropriate for me to give any comment, any recommendation. Uh, one thing I could, have, I could have stated, the one person that would have remained in his position on the 11th of August after the general election was the Commissioner of Police. Whoever is put in the position as Minister of National Security, I would work with that, that individual in the same professional manner that I have done, and I give the assurance to the public that whichever government, whichever minister, whichever prime minister holds that office, we will treat that person with dignity, with pride, with professionalism, because we are here to protect and serve with pride. We have sworn an oath to our God and to our country, and we will continue to do so regardless of who is the Prime Minister, the Minister of National Security, or whoever is in government. Thank you, Commissioner Griffith. Could you tell us what is the police, police's stance on uh, members of the service openly showing support to a political party, as in this general election passed there, and are any of your officers under investigation for having openly supported a political well, party? Well, as I just mentioned, one, one is presently on suspension, and uh, we, we have investigations ongoing for two others. I think I, I set the tone very early when that individual was suspended. I have no intention for any police officer to openly show any degree of um, political support or affiliation. Every police officer, it is his or her right to have, to have gone into uh, that, that general election and vote, that is your right, but you cannot in any form or fashion show any degree of open support. When you do that, it would compromise the integrity of the Trinidad Tobago Police Service because any investigation that could take place, especially if it pertains to high profile investigations pertaining that can be of a political nature, it can be perceived that the police have, have shifted left or right. I, as the Commissioner of Police, um, I, I did say that my hands, um, you know, you, there's this thing that I don't know what it is that we have, that everybody has to do this on, on the Monday night. My hands are clear. I made sure I did not vote. And at any time, me as I think the one person that should not vote is the Commissioner of Police. Because if I vote, it can give some degree of perception that I am politically aligned or have some degree of political affiliation one way or the other. The rest of my police officers, they were free to do so. I did not do so. And I am not going to have any police officer show any degree of open bias or favoritism to any political party. Um, Vivian Bowen from Network News. 
Um, my question is basically, I heard they give a breakdown just now of a list of crimes affecting the Venezuelan nationals. So I'd like to know similarly, do you have a breakdown of people who were held or arrested for crimes against the Venezuelan nationals? Yes, yes, we do. I don't have it on me or fan, but um, again, one of the things that we have seen is that individuals will try to lure Venezuelan nationals into Trinidad and Tobago under, um, with, with false promises, and then after they turn them now, hold on to their passports, charge them um, to, to, for room and board. They then turn them into a life of, of prostitution. Some of them are, are minors. So you speak about virtual slavery, prostitution, child prostitution, abuse, um, and with that, obviously, we are looking at these individuals and trying to see how best we can deal with it. Uh, we, we, if it is we work with these NGOs, get the information, it can assist us greatly to try to remove this situation. It is totally unacceptable in this modern era that we have a situation of virtual slavery, child prostitution taking place in this country. But, but, but you don't have figures pertaining to people who are held or arrested? I, I could not. Uh, yeah. Well, probably on the next occasion, we could provide we'll that be for you. able we to do, have. We do. But, but we have a direct relationship with the Human Trafficking Unit. And in fact, recently, we have opened an um, a analysis desk at the Copper Branch to deal directly with human trafficking. And with, so therefore, all the data, everything will be there. So probably on the next occasion, we'll be able to provide that uh, may I also add, we also have the data of many persons from Venezuela who have been involved in criminal activity, aiding and abetting, and, and being, some of them being charged, and some of them being closely monitored. Those individuals, even though they may have their get-out-of-jail-free card, they can be removed if it is that at any time someone is deemed a threat to national security or be a liability to the public purse, that person, based on the recommendation by the Minister of National Security, can immediately be deported. One last question. Um, I'm not sure if I got the memo, but um, the Commissioner's Cup, did it um, pull off? No, uh, we eventually got the approval from the Minister of Health and the Minister of National Security, but as we were going into the general election, we are too close now getting into September when the Secondary Schools League may, take, may, may, may commence, so we have decided to push it back now to January. Yeah, yeah, um, yes, we have situations like that. The, our fraud squad is vigorously investigating that aspect, right? And we have identified various locations, so the investigation is, is, is being, being done, right? And uh, very soon you'll get the necessary outcomes. Yeah. As the investigation is taking place, it will not be wise at this point in time. It can hamper the investigation. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, members of the media. Exactly one hour. Enjoy your weekend.